Hey guys, welcome back to another video and today we're going to be talking all things running shoes. You're going to get the whole lowdown and learn a lot of things. It's going to be very informative. I do want to keep this video quite structured, so I'm going to separate them into seven key sections. So firstly, we're going to talk about why it's important, followed by the actionable steps that you can take today, followed by what is pronation, what a good fitting shoe is. Then we'll talk about my favorite part, which is how the characteristics of a shoe can change where the load goes. And then we'll talk about some common mistakes that people make when buying shoes. And then cap it off with the three most important things to consider when buying shoes. So hope you enjoy this video and timestamps are in the description. First of all, we're gonna talk about why it's important. Number one, it's what connects our feet to the ground. Being in the incorrect shoe for a long period of time can cause consequences that you don't want to happen because if you're in the wrong fitting shoe and we'll talk about the correct fit later, you could have your feet crammed or curled which can't be good in terms of wanting to move the load in the right area in a non-crammed shoe. It allows us to run further and enjoy it rather than having our toes hurt or losing our toenails and all that sort of stuff which you can avoid with the correct shoe and the correct fit. So here are some actionable steps that you can take today. Go into a running specialty store where people know what they're talking about. So you obviously want to be served by runners who have tried a lot of shoes. Ideally with like an exercise science or biomechanics background. Because that will definitely mean that you're getting served by someone that knows what they're talking about. Another useful tip is to bring your current pairs and your old pairs of shoes into the store for the specialist to have a look at. Depending on where they see the wear pattern, they can recommend different categories of shoes or even just different types of shoes and stuff like that. Most of the time we want to see the wear pattern. This is the right foot. You want to be landing on the outside of the heel and you want to be rolling in. And on the contrary, when you see a lot of wear on the outside of the shoe, so landing on the heel and staying on the outside, you want to go for a shoe that's really cushioned because that obviously means that you're not rolling in and absorbing the shock, so you want the cushioning under the foot. But with that being said, I do want to caveat that and say that in my opinion, cushioning doesn't matter too much because if you imagine going barefoot and running on concrete, you're not going to land on your heel over stride and take a low cadence. You're probably going to increase the amount of steps you take, you're probably going to land a bit softer, you're probably going to land on your forefoot. So that just proves that depending on the amount of cushioning the shoe has, you're going to naturally adapt to how much cushioning there is. And you don't have to restrict the cushion shoes for the long runs and then less cushion shoes for the short runs. I would just completely mix everything up because you're just giving your body a bit more stimulus in all different directions, which is a good thing. One thing to remember is that when you go into a running shoe store, you should be asked some qualifying questions in order for them to be able to give you some recommendations. If anyone recommends one particular shoe, they're probably trying to sell you that because they get commissioned or something. Luckily, I work in an environment where I don't get commissioned at all from any of the brands so I'm really neutral across all the brands. But they should be asking you stuff like what shoes you currently have in rotation. And they would ideally look at the bottom of your shoes and look at the wear pattern. They would also ask you if you have any injuries or niggles right now and how often you run, if you're training for anything at all, what terrain you're on and all that sort of stuff. Because the more they ask you, the more they'll seem like they know what they're recommending because they're basing it off of more information rather than blindly recommending one particular model without getting any information from you. Always keep that in mind, the people that are more in general probably know more about what they're talking about because they should know that one shoe isn't for everyone and that there can be multiple shoes that work for you and at the end of the day, it's about comfort. And quickly to follow up on that, you should be answering the questions that they ask you honestly because then they can make a professional judgment based off of those answers. If you run quite a lot, then let them know that you run quite a lot. If you're not rotating that many shoes right now, let them know that as well because then they can base off their recommendation depending on what you already have and try and go for something a little bit different that stresses a different part of the leg. Because like I say all the time, every shoe stresses a different part of the leg and you want to even that out by having flexible shoes, stiff shoes, soft, firm, and all that sort of stuff. All right, this is me from the future and I thought I had to add this, but please, please, please get measured up by the shoe fitter. Don't go in and be like, I'm a size 40, I'm a size 42, I'm a size 44, I'm a size 39. We don't want to hear that. We want to measure you up because casual shoes fit differently and most of the time people are in the wrong shoe size anyway. The amount of people that come in and I convince them to get measured up and it's completely different to the size they said is insane. So just trust the person that's measuring you up and let them do their job because that's what they're getting paid to do. So the final actionable step is to forget the color and looks and go for whatever is the best shoe for you. Sure, this might look nice, but it might not be the best shoe for you. So definitely try and go for function over form. 
So now I want to talk a bit about pronation, which is, you know, a topic that a lot of people have different views on depending on where you're coming from. And even between podiatrists, physios and health professionals, you're going to get a ton of different opinions from the results. So it's very interesting. But here's my take on it after talking to many podiatrists and physios around this topic. My opinion is that pronation is a shock absorbing mechanism which is completely normal for humans to do in order to absorb shock, like I said. If you don't pronate, that actually means you have a high arch and a rigid arch that doesn't collapse and you're going to be landing a lot harder, meaning you probably want a bit more cushioning. Whereas if you do pronate, you are absorbing a bit more shock, you could probably get away with less cushioning. But the funny thing is the shoe industry likes to make problems out of nothing in order to sell more shoes in order to create more categories of shoes when you don't actually need all those fancy categories. There used to be a ridiculous stage where we would have mild pronation control shoes, heavy pronation control shoes and stuff like that. But I feel like a lot of shoes are starting to become more neutral, which is a very good thing because only a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of the population need arch support. Whereas a lot of people currently think that everyone needs arch support, but that's not the case. A good person to talk to regarding this sort of stuff and to consume content from is Andy Bryant on Instagram. He went on a podcast called Stronger Stride, which is hosted by my friends Sophie and Lydia, but he did a really good episode with Sophie and Lydia talking about everything to do with the foot. And I love his outlook on shoes because it's more traditional. It's not looking at all these fancy orthotics that cost hundreds of dollars and all that sort of stuff. I think he encourages you know, natural foot movements and all that, which is a very good thing. And I was also talking to my friend John, who is the founder of the MAP movement, which I'll link in the description as well, who was talking to me about how there's two key shapes of feet, which is a high arch and a low arch. And it's good to be able to maintain both of them and be able to switch between the two. And here, stuck in the high arch, obviously you're gonna pound the pavement, not roll in and absorb a shock. So you're gonna be putting more impact forces up the leg. But if you're completely flat and can't lift up the arch, you're not really getting that propulsive motion off the ground. Flat feet has been seen as a bad thing in the past, but the interesting thing that John and I were talking about this morning is that there's one less step to get propulsion off the ground because for someone that does have a high arch that can roll in, you're gonna have to go from that high arch position to a collapsed position and then back to a high arch to like propel yourself up. Whereas someone with a flat foot is gonna start like that and they can just bounce up whenever they want without having that extra step of having to go down before going up. So don't think of flat feet as a bad thing. Everyone has different feet. We all come in different shapes and sizes. So why would you think that the feet have to be uniform and stuff like that. So that's kind of my take on pronation. I can make a whole different video on this because there's so much to talk about, but that's about all I'll get into in this video. So if you've ever talked to me about shoes, I've probably told you this and I sound like a broken record when I say this because I say it hundreds of times all the time, but what you're looking for in terms of a fit in a shoe, so a good fitting shoe is where you're locked in the heel, locked over the midfoot, over the laces, but in front of the final lace, you want space. Another thing to keep in mind is that everyone has different size feet. You're probably gonna have a discrepancy of like a quarter to half a size, and yeah, no one's made equal. So you wanna accommodate the bigger foot because you wanna make sure the bigger foot has the correct fit, and the smaller foot will rely on the lockdown over the laces to hold the foot back so that it doesn't slide forward. So as long as you have that feeling where you're locked over the knuckle or the midfoot of the shoe, you want your toes to have wiggle room because your toes do all the stabilization of your foot, especially your big toe, which cops 80% of your load when running. So it's the big toe for a reason. We want the big toe to stay natural. We don't want the big toe to be crammed in. And from what I hear from podiatrists that really know what they're talking about, the big toe not being crammed in is probably the most important thing in a shoe. So forget cushioning, forget arch support, forget everything else. The one thing you want to make sure in every shoe is that your big toe is not being crammed in. You want your big toe to stay completely natural. Another thing to note is that your foot will swell when you run for a long period of time. If you wake up in the morning and you stand for a lot of the day or walk around and stuff like that, and you're putting a lot of weight on your feet and you run at the end of the day, your foot's gonna be bigger than it was at the start of the day. So you wanna keep that in mind and make sure you have plenty of space. What I also like to say is literally, as long as you're locked here and here, it doesn't matter if you have a thumb's worth of space, a thumb and a half worth of space, two thumbs worth of space, because you're gonna be locked here 
and therefore you're not going to be sliding forward. If you're not feeling locked here, go for another model of shoe or another brand rather than going smaller because you never want to sacrifice that thumbs with the space at the end of the shoe. If you are like a women's size 6 or a 5 or whatever, then you can probably get away with slightly less than a thumb. But as a general rule of thumb, pun un unintended but intended I guess, try and keep a thumbs width at the end of the shoe. Especially if you're starting to get into long distances, you'll appreciate the fact that you have more space in the front. Another thing to note is when you're towing off, when you're about to lift off the ground, the shoe will usually flex a little bit, but your toes are not going to get shorter. So if you're constantly flexing that shoe there and your toes banging on the edge for 9,000, 10,000, 20,000 steps in a run, you're obviously going to lose some toenails and you're going to be banging the front. And a lot of people complain about getting holes at the front of the shoe and 9 times out of 10, and probably even 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it's going to be because you're wearing a shoe that's too small for you. And in the rare scenario, it's going to be because you have this thing where your big toe naturally points up or something like that. And that can cause a bit more tension. And in that case, you just want a shoe that has a higher ceiling so that you're not going to go through the end of the shoe. So that's your kind of brief rundown on how you want the shoe to feel. You want to be locked here, locked here, and you want the space at the front. So it's important to understand a little bit about how the characteristic of a shoe can affect where the load goes. So for example, this is a very flexible shoe. This is a very stiff shoe. This is also a stiff shoe, but these two achieve a stiff shoe in a different way because this one has a carbon fiber plate that runs through it. If it didn't have the carbon fiber plate, it would probably flex a bit more, but the carbon fiber really makes it rigid or stiff, like doesn't flex at all, no matter how much I try. Whereas the Bondi, no plate in it, but it has so much cushioning or so much snack, which you call it, that it doesn't flex much. So here's some more useful information. In a flexible shoe, your foot is able to flex in this joint, which is the metatarsophalangeal joint. When you restrict the movement of that joint by having a stiffer shoe that does not flex, you're basically doing this, where you're restricting the movement of that metatarsophalangeal joint, and you move the load to the joints that are more proximal, meaning a bit higher up in the leg chain. And therefore, you're going to be loading up the knee and the hip a little bit more and the muscles in that upper part of the leg. Excuse my random pair of shorts. So that also means when you have a flexible shoe, you're going to be working the intrinsic muscles of the foot and a bit more of the ankle posterior muscles here compared to the knee and the hip. We also have shoes with a high drop, meaning it's higher in the heel compared to the toe. And then we also have shoes with no drop or lower drop where the heel and the toe are the same stack height. The difference between these two is that this will take tension off the Achilles and the calf, but it would load up another part of the leg. When you take away load from one part of the leg, you're going to load up another part, meaning you take away the load from the calf and the Achilles, but you load up the knee and the hip a bit more. This shoe would obviously work the foot and the ankle a bit more, but it would take a lot of load off the knee and the hip. If we take a quick look at this diagram, you can see that in a high drop shoe, your center of mass moves forward because the heel is lifted up. And in a lower drop shoe, your center of mass moves back and therefore you deload the kneecap area. And finally, we have soft shoes and a firm shoe. Now, this is visually very, very soft. Probably one of the softest shoes that I know of right now, the 1080 V13. One thing to consider is if you have a history of rolling your ankle, it can feel a little bit unstable when it's soft. So you might not want to be in a soft shoe if you have a history of rolling your ankle. A firm shoe on the other hand would be really planted and kind of stable and therefore it might be a good option for some people as well. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly add this extra clip where I talk about how the drop of a shoe can affect how you land, so whether you land on your heel or your forefoot, but also vice versa, how the way you land might affect what shoe you get. It is commonly known that a lower drop shoe, where the heel and the toe are more similar in height, will be more liked by forefoot strikers, whereas a higher drop shoe like this, where the heel is a lot higher than the toe, will be more enjoyed by heel strikers. And the reason for that is, when you're already in a plantar flex position where your heel is higher than the toe, it's so much easier to land on your heel when you're landing. Whereas when you're in a low drop shoe, imagine there's no difference in height between the heel and the toe. It's so much easier to just go like that and land on your forefoot. So that's why forefoot strikers prefer a flatter shoe where they can just go like that. But heel strikers, they want to go like that and then land on the heel and then roll forward. So they prefer the higher drop shoe. 
So what does this rule mean? This means that every single shoe has multiple different factors where you're going to be sitting a bit more towards loading up the knee or loading up the ankle or elsewhere. But there's so many different characteristics that there's no such thing as a shoe that completely loads up the hip and nothing else. And there's no such thing as a shoe that completely loads up the Achilles and nothing else. You're always going to have like a spectrum depending on those multiple characteristics that we talked about today. And that is why there's no such thing as a perfect shoe, but rotating between everything is just going to work different muscles all the time and you're going to stay injury free because you're not overloading on one part of the leg. We're now going to talk about the three most common mistakes that people make when buying shoes. Number one is going too small, like short or narrow. And as we talked about with the good fit, we want to make sure that our toes aren't crammed or curled and therefore that's important. And number two is buying shoes online because every shoe fits differently and you're not going to know how they fit until you try it on. And yes, you can read something online that says it fits small or it fits big, but you never know about the width to length ratio and all that sort of stuff until you try it on in person. There's also something else to factor in, which is the shoe height. Because some people with a higher arch can have a taller foot and a shoe with a lower ceiling can make that feel crammed. And a lot of people don't even think about that when buying shoes. The third thing to consider is that everyone thinks that cushioning is the be all end all. But in reality, cushioning doesn't make as much of a difference than you think because your body adapts to how much cushioning there is under a shoe. If you run barefoot on concrete, you're obviously not going to slam the ground with your heel and overstride. You're obviously going to land on your forefoot, land a bit softer, flex it all the joints. And that's the same thing with max cushion shoes or minimal shoes. If you wear a minimal shoe, you're going to land a bit softer, increase your cadence. If you're in a more cushion shoe, you'll probably get lazy, you'll land a bit stiff, you'll land a bit harder, you'll probably decrease your cadence, you might even overstride a little bit. So your body will adapt to how much cushioning there is. Your body's very smart and therefore don't worry about cushioning all the time. It's not all about that. I'd rather get someone in the correct fitting shoe than go for more cushioning. So to conclude this video, if there's three points that I want you to take away today, it would be that you want to check if you have injuries or not and where the injuries and niggles are because the shoe specialist will recommend different shoes depending on where you have niggles and injuries at the current moment. The second thing to focus on is whether to go for a support shoe or a neutral shoe. Most people will be going for a neutral shoe as I've talked about in this video. And the third thing that's important to remember and probably the most important is the fit of the shoe. So not having your big toe crammed in or needing to curl your toes in order to fit in a smaller size. We want to make sure we have a thumb's worth of space to be locked in the heel, locked over the midfoot and have the space at the front. Hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful. I think working at a running shoe store and fitting thousands of people and getting you know good feedback on my service, I think it was important for me to kind of get this information out there to make it easier for both you and people fitting shoes because it will make it so much easier if everyone's kind of on the same page so hopefully you can share this video with your friends because buying shoes can be stressful but it won't be as stressful if you know the right information and you go into the right place where people know their stuff so with that being said leave a like on this video comment below if you have any questions and i will see you in the next one